everybody? Everybody good? We got Anderson and Greenville campus and people watching online tonight, six o'clock. And uh, man, I've been looking forward to this all day long. Hey, everybody should be in a good mood. Um, pretty much everybody's team won yesterday, right? Georgia in the SEC championship, don't bark. Um, we got South Carolina. That they beat Arkansas yesterday. Uh, Clemson um, beat Maryland yesterday, so that was good. Um, if you're an Alabama fan, um, we've got we've got uh, counseling available for you tonight. I am so glad we do not have an Alabama campus. That would be that would be tough, man. But listen, Texas A&M came in and smacked them in the mouth. All right, let's pray and go home. Uh, anyway, seriously, I'm so glad you're here. And let me say this before we dive in. Um, I, I came out here and mentioned last week about the Hurricane San, you know, Sandy thing that was going on up north and how we were going to partner with Hillsong New York um, to kind because of, they're on the ground. I mean, they're doing work, and, and what they're doing up there, they're at, you know, meeting needs one person at a time. And I announced that we're going to take an offering last week, and I said many of you I know didn't come prepared to give, um, and I directed you toward the online giving, and many of you I know you went and you gave online but I just want to announce that at our campuses, without even being ready, without even being prepped, without even being prepared, that you guys gave over $18,000 last week, and we were able to send that to New York to kind of help out. And so, man, that was, that was awesome, and so I want to thank you for that. Um, if you're brand new tonight, if this is your first time here, we're in the middle of a series called Eve and Adam. And if you know anything about the Bible, you probably are thinking, well, it's supposed to be Adam and Eve, and you're right. And we did that back in the spring for the men, and all that's on the website, newspring.cc, if you want to go there and check out those old messages. But for the past several weeks, we've been talking about Eve and Adam. And specifically, what does it look like to be a woman in the scriptures that's fully, completely dedicated to the Lord and working through relationships and marriage and all that stuff. And so it's been a lot of fun. So um, we started it out with lies that women believe. And we said, and I think we all agreed, and we didn't even say it was bad, but women tend to be more emotional than men. And we didn't, we're, once again, we didn't say that was a bad thing. It was just accurate. So we talked about we must submit the emotional to the biblical and kind of wrestle through those issues. And then last week we talked about um, is, are, am I with the right one, the characteristics of Jesus, and specifically how Jesus treated women and men, we took a challenge away from that. If we're going to be men like Jesus, we've got to treat women like Jesus treated women. And at the end of the, um, at the, end of the message, we showed the video from Trish, and, and I don't think there was a dry eye in the house here last week. And, and 174 people gave their lives to Christ last week at a New Spring service. So we're celebrating that. Tonight, I've been, I've been looking forward to this one. Uh, tonight is five questions that every single girl should be asking. Now, you're probably here and you're thinking, well, Perry, here's my question for you. Why would you do a message that targets such a small population of the church? I mean, why would you do a message specifically focused on single girls? So here's what I'm going to do. In just a second, I'm going to have all the single girls raise your hand. And listen, th let me explain what I, what I mean when I mean single. I mean, you're not married. Okay, if you're engaged, you don't have to raise your hand. But if you're sitting next to a boy you've been dating for two years, listen, sweetheart, if he liked it, then he should have put a ring on it, all right? <laughs> you, I just need you to be honest and raise your hand. So if you're single, if you're a girl in here, would you just raise your hand and leave it up high? Okay, look around, look around, look around. I'm trying to help some of you guys out. Look around. <laughs> no, 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 seriously, seriously, look around. Because, okay, you can put your hands down. Thank you so much. In Greenville, I'm sure you... See, here's the deal. Guys go, we're all the good girls. <laughs> You're fishing in a trout pond, bro. Like, like, what are you doing? Anyway, you should volunteer at a New Spring campus, all the services. I'm, I'm just saying. Um, my, first of all, it's not a small population in our church. There's a lot of single girls that call New Spring Church their home. And I'm so, so glad you're here. And I believe, and I believe this with all my heart, one of the reasons I would do a message like this is because I believe the primary problems in our nation and in the world are not political. I believe they're relational. And I believe we could solve a lot of problems that we think are political if we dealt with things on the relational level. And I believe a lot of problems in marriage can be solved if we got dating right. So if you're single, if you're a single girl here tonight, Man, I, I am praying so hard that you receive everything in this message. And listen, listen, I want you to listen. If you're single again, 
meaning you were married, and for one reason or the other, you, you got a divorce, everything in this message applies to you. Because one of the things that women tend to go through that have been divorced is they start thinking, well, I'm damaged goods, and I've been through that, and, and now I'm, like, if single girls are here, then I'm one stage below them, and I've got to lower my standards. And listen to me, nothing could be further from the truth. Nothing could be further from the truth. So this is for you. So, um, and listen, if you're a single guy, you should really be excited that you're here tonight because you're like, I picked the wrong night to show up. No, first of all, I showed you every single girl in the room right off the bat, okay? But second, you're going to get to hear um, a lot about how girls think. And listen, you need all the help with that you can get because I do. That's not a crack. And so that's a motivation. My, mo my other motivation is ultimately you're going to hear the gospel tonight. And I just put my cards on the table and say, I hope you give your life to Christ before the end of the night or sooner or later um, that you'll do that. But on June 27, 2007, the way I view girls um, really took a major turn, specifically the way I view single girls, because that's the day that my daughter was born, Karis. Now, you always hear stories about Karis. You'll probably hear a couple tonight. And so before we move on, I thought it would be real cool if I actually got to introduce my daughter to you. So this is my little girl, Karis. Karis, come out here, baby. <clears throat> this is my little sweetheart. All right. She's wearing her blinged out kid spring shirt. You having fun today? I am. I am. Hey, listen. So we're going to talk about some questions and uh, stick to the script, stuff, everything we prearranged, all right? Um, what is your favorite restaurant? Waffle House. Waffle House, that's right. Hey, what's your favorite thing to eat at the Waffle House? Eggs and a chocolate chip waffle. Eggs and a chocolate chip waffle, right? And she gets that when she goes with daddy and chocolate milk to drink. Um, who is your favorite singer? Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. What's your favorite song that she sings? Mean. Mean? You want to sing it? Mm. No. -uh, okay. <laughs> hey, would you like to meet Taylor Swift one day? I would. All right. See that little red light? I want you to look right in that camera, and I want you to say, Taylor, I would really love to meet you one day. Go ahead. Taylor, I would really like to meet you one day. <laughs> Have a heart, Taylor. All right. Um. <laughs> If you could go anywhere in the world, where would you go? Disney. Disney. And how does mommy and daddy love you? Always and forever, no matter what. That's right. Well, can you say goodbye to everybody? Bye. Say it was cool hanging out with y'all. <laughs> hey, Greenville Campus. Hey, Greenville Campus. All right, she got that in. That is awesome. All right, they just lost their minds in Greenville. They're still giving each other high five. All right, bye. I think she has my car keys. Anyway, um, <laughs> so really when I was preparing this message, I kind of sat down and thought about questions that I would want her to, to I would want a, her to go through. And, and some of you girls are here tonight, some of you, and, and listen, most of us, if not all of us, we're being willing to admit it in some way, shape, form, or fashion, have daddy issues. And so you see me holding Karis, and you're thinking, well, um, I wish I had a father like that. And you do. You do. In fact, your heavenly father, his love for you makes my love for that little girl look pretty bad. It really does. And, uh, and so I just want you to know that he feels as passionate about you as I do about her. Because I want you to listen to me, and I'm not joking. Every year for her birthday, I buy me a brand new gun. <laughs> Straight up. You might be here tonight, and you're like, I'm in favor of gun control. Me too. I have a gun. I control anyone that comes in my house that doesn't belong. That's how I feel about gun control. We can pull that off in the South. If I was in Texas, they would elect me governor. But um, <laughs> I, I'm just saying, I, and, and when the guy, when the first guy comes over that ever takes her out, I'm going to bring him in the living room. I'm going to have them all laid out. And some of you are like, you're going to clean your gun? No, because if I shoot him, I want the gun to be dirty. I want the bullet to be infected. I, I, I want the whole thing to go bad for this guy. So, man, I love her. But, but ladies, your heavenly father loves you so much more. And listen, he will protect his daughters. Single guys, you need to, and married guys too, you need to understand that God will fight for and protect his daughters. And so with that in mind, single ladies, I want to list for you five questions. And let me just kind of say, 
It's going to get a little tense a couple times tonight, mainly for the women, a couple times for the men, but mainly for the women, and, uh, but it's going to also be fun. And I hope that Jesus will use this um, to launch you into a healthy, godly relationship one day. Question number one, am I who he is looking for? Am I who he is looking for? It's a great first question because in America, we tend to have what I like to refer to as someone sickness or single sickness, and it goes like this. I am incomplete. My life is falling apart. Everything about me is wrong, but when I find the right one, when I find him, my life is going to be great, and I'll never have a bad day because he's always going to make it a good day. And I won't need things like patience because he's never going to do anything that actually tests my patience. And I'm not going to have to deal with my anger issues because he's never actually going to do anything that makes me angry. And I'm not going to have to deal with any of the baggage in my life because he would never do anything to hurt me or wound me or rip that scab off of that wound. And let me tell you something, ladies. He is out there and you'll find him standing between the unicorn and the leprechaun <laughs> and he's driving a dependable Chevy truck <laughs> See, some of you didn't get that he's like what's the correlation those three things don't exist all right I mean you just need to know I'm trying to pull the NASCAR fans in that guy's not out there and, and ladies, I want you to listen. If you put that kind of weight on a man, you will crush him because he cannot sustain the weight of your worship. He can't sustain it. And so instead of trying to find the right one, I think the challenge for every single lady here that I want you to hear tonight is that you would become the right one. That you would be, and I had a friend of mine put this so well, that you would be the one that the other guy is looking for. You would be the one, you would be that one instead of trying to find that one, that you would work on your relationship with Jesus. We pick this up, if you brought a Bible with you tonight, Genesis chapter 2, story of Adam and Eve, Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, um, and a little bit of 4, contain the story of Adam and Eve. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, the Bible says this, and th this is a good vision, ladies, of where I think you should aim. The Bible says in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18, the Lord God said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I will make a helper, I want you to underline that word, helper suitable for him. Ladies, a helper. So my question for every single lady here tonight, and only you and the Lord can answer this question, is this. If God gave you to a man in your current condition tonight, would you help him or would you hurt him in his walk with Christ? If God gave you, in the condition that you're in, to a man tonight, would you help him or would you hurt him in his walk with Christ? Because, ladies, the Bible doesn't say that, that the man's supposed to reign over you. Okay, In my life, I do not reign over Lucretia. She helps me. She comes along beside me, and together... We walk with Christ, and I help her in her walk. She helps me in my walk. We are mutually beneficial to each other. I'm not dragging her along. She's not dragging me along. It is a beautiful thing because I married a help. I married the one that I believe God designed to come alongside me and help me. So if God gave you to a man, would he say, thank you, Jesus, or why me, Lord? It's a good question. Now, ladies, I could get, because some of you ladies, you're like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, I don't have it all together. I could never get married. Ladies, if you wait till you have it all together to get married, enjoy being single for the rest of your life. You don't have it all together, and there's not a man on the planet that has it all together. Having it all together isn't a condition to get married. Here's what you need to do to put yourself in the position to be the best helper for a man possible. You fix your eyes on Jesus, and you walk with him every single day. 
It doesn't mean you're not going to mess up. It doesn't mean you're not going to make, mis- make mistakes. It means, hey, today is the day I'm going to choose to fix my eyes on Jesus, and I'm going to walk with him. Because if you're walking with Jesus, you're walking away from sin. If you're walking with Jesus, you're walking away from baggage. And the way that you progress spiritually in a walk with Christ is every single day, I'm going to try my best to take one more step. And no, none of us have it all together, but if we will dead our, dedicate ourselves to that process, I'm telling you, it just works. Because at the end of the day, one of these days, I believe with all my heart, you're going to meet that guy. I have a friend of mine that pastors a church in Atlanta, and he tells the story of a girl that um, (laughs) she grew up in church, and she was a good church girl. She did everything right. She dotted the I's, crossed the T's, moved to Atlanta, went to college, and let's just say she went down a path that she shouldn't have gone down. And many of you that went to college or are in college, you remember freshman, sophomore, junior year, sometimes you kind of test the boundaries or you dive over the boundaries or there are no boundaries or whatever. But you do some things that at the end of the day, you know they're not right no matter how much you want to justify them. And so she did that. And she wound up in an environment one night where she met this guy who was godly, a really godly young man, loved, loved Jesus, was involved in church, had a job, Real, I mean, she was head over heels in love with this guy as soon as she met him. She goes home for the weekend, and she's telling her mom, oh, my gosh, this guy's awesome. This guy's amazing. I found the one I'm looking for. And her mom turned around and looked straight at her in the eye and said, the problem is, sweetheart, he's not looking for a girl like you. And she dropped to the ground in tears because she knew her mother was right. And at the end of the day, ladies, today's the day that you stop looking for the right one and you start becoming the right one. Question number two, am I desperate? Am I desperate? You know desperate people don't make great decisions? Nobody's ever said, man, that was an awesome decision. How'd you make that? I was desperate. Because, listen, one of these days... You're going to want to tell your story, ladies and gentlemen. Like, because that's one of the things I love to do. If I'm hanging out with a couple, if we're together and we're going to hang out, one of the things I'm going to ask is, how did y'all wind up together? I love to hear stories about how couples wound up together. It's one of my favorite things to listen to because I've heard some really interesting stories. This is the story you don't want to tell one day to your children or your grandchildren. All right, y'all gather around. I'm going to tell you how me and your grandpa got together. There was nobody left. (laughs) All of our friends got married. And so when I saw your grandfather, I knew I could do better. But he was kind of like the box of stale Ritz crackers at the back of the pantry. You know you could do better. You just don't want to wait or go get in your car and go to Publix. And so you take the crackers and you kind of, and you eat them. And that's what your grandfather is to me. And that's how we've been together all these years. Oh, like, like that's, not, that's not a love story. Desperate people do not make great decisions. In fact, and you can tweet this if you want, desperation in dating always leads to destruction. Always. Desperation in dating always leads to destruction. And our culture fuels desperation among women. It's going to get tense right here because I'm going to crack on something a lot of you love, but I just want you to listen to me. I want you to hear me out. One of the ways that we know that our culture feeds into the desperation of women is one of the most popular shows on television, and it's been for a long time, is The Bachelor. What's he going to say about The Bachelor? I'm going to say, if you are a woman and you love The Bachelor, something's broken in you. Yeah, that's half the people. And the other half are like, <laughs> I will kill you. Anyway, that, like that's, hey, found out this afternoon on Twitter that one of the former contestants on The Bachelor, one of the girls was at one of our campuses this morning. She was like, awkward moment. I was like, you know, anyway, I hadn't met her yet, but that was really interesting. Got to, I probably have a Chevy truck dealer somewhere too. But anyway, I... Let's talk about that show for a minute, because some of you are like, I love that show. There's nothing wrong with it, really. 
Just think about that for a minute. They get a good-looking guy, and listen, that's the only reason. He's a, he's a good-looking guy. You know, like, he normally has, like, swooshy hair, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> he's, he's not the sharpest knife in the drawer, but he's good-looking, right? And 25 to 30 girls, sometimes, some seasons it's 25. I think one season they had 30, 30 girls compete for him. And it turns out it's a bunch of mean girls. You ever see that movie, Mean Girls? That's what it is. And so he goes out on group dates with them, and then he, this is how he drops you. You don't get the rose, right? And so he has the rose ceremony or whatever, and then he narrows it down, and he has like several, and he kind of has some romantic encounters with them. So he goes out, and he hooks up with all them. He kind of compares, you know. And then it comes down to four, right? And he does the in-home visit with four, meets the parents. Oh, hey, how you doing, sir? Nice to meet you. It was nice to meet you, too. Hey, I hooked up with your daughter. She's all right. There's another girl. I'm going to go hook up with her, too. I'm going to meet her dad, and maybe I'll pick you. See, me, if I'm the dad right there, I snap his neck, and the show is over. Like, I'm that dad, okay? So, but some dads are just big, like, <laughs> like I, I just, so, stay with me. And so, what was that one year where they, where he had the girls fly in on the helicopter, and the girl flies in on the helicopter, and he's like, uh-uh. And then, they, like, she flies off, and she's crying, and they get together, and the show is like, oh, it's so awesome. Listen to me. 17 seasons of that show, and not one couple has gotten together. 17 seasons. So some of y'all going, oh, but it's so cute. Okay, let's go parachuting after the service. We'll have 17 parachutes. None of them work. Anybody want to jump? But it fuels desperation among women. Now, some of you are going, no, no, no. One couple did get together. That guy, and a few seasons ago, he married. No, no, no. He didn't choose the one he did not get together with a woman he chose he got together with a woman he rejected and they've only been married for three years so we don't know how that's going to turn out yet hey don't mess with me i've done my research (laughs) see we think we think happily ever after they get together and they live happily ever after but married people does happily ever after work Mm -mm. hey in fact some of you single people you saw it happen with your parents happily ever after is a myth That's why there's vows that say, for better, for worse, for richer or poorer, in sickness and health, as long as you both shall live, till death do you part. If happily ever after was real, the preacher would just say, be happy. (laughs) Now watch Adam and Eve right here. Pick it up in verse 19. The Bible says this. Now the Lord God had formed out of the ground all the wild animals and all the birds in the sky, and he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. We'll talk about that in a little while. It's really cool. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds in the sky, and all the wild animals. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while I was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. The man said, notice the man initiates. This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. That is why a man leaves his father and mother, and he's united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Adam and his wife were both naked, (laughs) and they felt no shame. And all the married people said, Amen. amen. That's right. Love that verse. Because I've talked to guys before, and they're like, well, I know how to get naked with a woman. Yeah, but can you do it and feel no shame? That's the trick. Can you do it and feel no shame, both you and her? So the whole desperation thing, like, this is just natural. Nobody was desperate. See, Adam went to work, and we talked about that before, right? And he names all the animals. Had to be the coolest job in the world, right? Right? I mean, at first, he's, like, really excited about it. Hippopotamus. <laughs> Kangaroo. Then he gets bored. Dog. Bird. Cat. God's like, who made that? I don't know. Anyway, so they're kind of having that whole conversation. And then he gets tired, and he went to sleep. He went to sleep. Don't miss this. Adam went to sleep because he worked, not because he played PlayStation for five hours. <laughs> Big difference. Okay? And so he goes to sleep. God makes the woman, establishes a relationship with her. He brings her to the man. The man is like, whoo, 
Woo! Like they get together and it's all, it's, nothing's forced, it's not complicated, and nobody's desperate. Lee, Eve was not like birthed from the Lord and I gotta have a man, I gotta have a man, I gotta have a man, I gotta have a man. And we all know that girl and she drives us up the wall. So ladies, let me give you two, and I could, I could do more here. Let me give you two signs that you're desperate. Number one, you're asking guys out. And see, I, some of you are like, well, you, you're just a little old-fashioned. We live in a different culture. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. Girls don't pursue guys. See, the, the lie that you believe, we talked about this um, in week number two of this series, is you believe you're not worth the pursuit, so you actually believe you've got to pursue the guy. And every once in a while, I'll meet a guy that goes, I don't think there's a problem with a girl asking a guy out. It's because you're a pathetic wuss. Seriously, you should go to Walmart tonight and buy some marbles because then you would have some. <laughs> I didn't say that at 9.15. Anyway, so. Now it's not wrong. We talked about this during Adam and Eve. It's not wrong for a girl to drop a hint. It's not wrong for a girl to drop a hint to indicate that she's interested. Right? We talked about that, right? Remember, you go up to him, you, you quote Genesis 2.18. I was reading this morning in my quiet time that it is not good for a man to be alone and I thought of you. <laughs> Hello! YOLO! Like, like, you could drop that on him, right? <laughs> Love 6 o'clock. Anyway, um... You... <laughs> <laughs> but you shouldn't ask a guy out you should not be the one to ask a guy out the second way you know you're desperate is if you're having sex with a guy you're not married to some of you girls are so desperate for intimacy that you'll give up fall, you'll, you'll give up real intimacy with Jesus for false intimacy with a guy and you say, well, it's not false intimacy, Perry. Really? Stop having sex with him and see how long he stays around. And don't tell me how good your relationship is with Jesus if you're having sex with a guy. Because here's what I know. You cannot pursue Jesus and pursue sexual immorality at the same time. And if you're having sex with a guy, you can't hear from the Lord. And it just means you're desperate. And you don't have to be desperate. Listen, because desperate people don't make great decisions. Question number three, why am I attracted to him? Great question. Why am I attracted to him? Because I've heard some wrong answers. He's cute. He won't be. Give it time. <laughs> hey, age happens to all of us. One of these days, he's going to have this little thing right here dangling, right? Like the little chicken neck. His hair's going to turn gray. It might turn loose. I mean, it might just give up and say, I surrender. Like, and just let go. I love this one. He makes me laugh. Get a comedy video, chick. Like, you don't, like, you don't have to have a guy to make you laugh. Why are you attracted to him? Can we agree, girls? Can we agree, especially when you were younger, you were attracted to the wrong type of guy? Can we agree? Can we agree? I remember in the sixth grade, there was a guy named Scott. And some of you are like, well... What if Scott's watching right now? <laughs> Scott is in prison, I'm sure. He is not watching right now. So, <laughs> Scott had failed at least two grades. We're not, because back in the day when I went to school, everybody didn't get a lollipop and a hug. If you didn't, if you didn't make the grade, you didn't get to go on. So, um, Scott had failed two grades, we think. There was a rumor that he might have failed a third. I don't know. Here's what I know. Scott had facial hair in the sixth grade. Sixth grade was a part of elementary school where I went. So homeboy had facial hair, and there was a rumor among the sixth grade guys that he drove to school. We couldn't prove that, but we thought he might. If you're driving to the So anyway, Scott would come in, had a mullet, because mullets were cool. I think one time he actually got his mullet permed, and so it's kind of permed in the back. He comes in. He's got the blue jean jacket with like some band name on the back. He always smelled like smoke, like, and so you knew he was smoking. And he was, he was that guy, and all the girls were like, he is so cute. And all the guys were like, Scott? <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Girls, don't, 
If not for you, think, girls, I heard another guy say this. It made so much sense. Think about the eggs inside of you. (laughs) And they're saying, Mom, give me a fighting chance. (laughs) Right? (laughs) Scott is not what we need, Mom. Run! <laughs> help me, help me like that. So, please, think, think about that though. It makes sense. So why, why are you attracted to him? You know why I think Eve was attracted to Adam? He worked for her. He worked for her. He was willing to work for her. Listen, before he ever knew her, he was working for her. Now, that's a man right there. Because, like, once again, he's naming the animals. And I think the reason that God had him name the animals, one of the reasons, is because if him and Eve would have named the animals together, they would still be naming animals. Because we know women are like, women, all right, they bring the animal, and Adam would be like, let's call it, hold on, hold on, hold on. Could you turn around? (laughs) Could you move over there? Giraffe. Like that, that's how that whole thing would have gone down. So Adam, he's he's thinking, you know, he's naming the animals and he's like, okay, dog. But um, okay, that's a God, what is that? Well, that's a boy dog. What is that? Oh, that's a girl dog. Okay, okay, got that. Uh crocodile. Okay, that's good. God, what is that? Well, that's a boy crocodile. Okay. What's that? That's a girl crocodile. Uh-huh. Okay, okay, okay. Got that, got that, got that. Bird. What's that? God, that's a boy bird. What's that? That's a girl. Okay, God, here's my question. What am I? You're a boy. Where's my girl? God, I got to get one of those. I mean, they all look happy right now. And, and what if God just said, You just need to keep working. He names the animals in 15 seconds flat. Like, they're they're just named. And he goes to sleep, like I said earlier, because he's tired. Ladies, let me ask you this question. One of these days when you meet a man, and he's willing to fight for your heart, is it romantic for him to say, yeah, I've just kind of lived life, and I've just kind of taken it, and I've kind of, I've kind of, done everything I wanted to do and now I'm ready to settle down and marry you or is it romantic for him to look at you and say I have worked for you for years and I didn't even know your name like that that's a man like is he willing to fight for your purity now and the reason you know he's willing to fight for your purity now is because he's fighting for his purity right now because a godly man will lead you away from the bedroom and away from compromising situations, and he will lead you towards Jesus. And if he's not leading you in that direction, he's not a godly man. I don't care how big his Bible is or how, many, how much theology he understands. Hey, ladies, here's the question you need to ask a guy when he asks you out on a date. Hey, can we go out on a date? I mean, you just need to be honest with him and go, oh my gosh, that is so cool. You asked me out on a date and you didn't even do the LOL thing on your text. And I think that is awesome. But here's the question I've got for you. Do you love Jesus? That's a great first question. Some of you are like, oh my gosh, that is so forward. I just don't know if I could do that. You, you don't know if you can do that because you, you think that a guy won't ask you out. Do do you love Jesus? I I just need to know if you love Jesus because, see, here's the deal. If you don't love Jesus, we're just going to waste each other's time. And if he goes, well, I go to church. I didn't ask you if you go to church. Like like the devil goes to church somewhere every week, okay? I'm not asking do you go to church. Well, I'm a Christian. Okay, in in the South, especially South Carolina, everybody's a Christian. I'm not asking if you're a Christian. I'm asking if you love Jesus because, see, here's the deal. Jesus is the man that's in the middle of my life. I love him. I worship him. I serve him. He died on the cross for my sins. When I get married one day, he's going to be the man in the middle of my relationship and he's if he's not the man the man in the middle of you he could never be the man in the middle of us and so I just need to know if he's the man in the middle of you because if he's not we're going to waste each other's time do you love Jesus great first question is he is he willing is he willing to fight for you 
I wrote this one down, and I, I wanted to look at this so I would make sure I remember it. Does he bring chaos or disorder into your world? Because God, what did God do? He brought the world from chaos to order. A godly man will bring your world from chaos to disorder. If he's bringing confusion and frustration and aggravation to your world, you might want to press the pause button. Is he willing? Or why are you attracted to him? Does he lead you to church? Or do you have to drag his butt to church every week? Because you've got to drag him now. When you get married, it'll get worse. In fact, let's go ahead and deal with that. Question number four. Are there issues with him that I'm avoiding? (laughs) Are there issues with him that I'm avoiding? And I know confrontation is really tough. There's some things, listen, can we just be honest? We don't want to talk about them. We don't want to talk about them. I had a friend of mine on a flight last week, true story, and they were coming into Atlanta, and the flight was real bumpy. I don't know if you've ever been one of those flights where you're like, i got to find the bag, i got to find the bag, somebody give me the bag. The flight's bumpy, and it's coming in like this, and the guy next to my friend didn't even know his name. Did, they, didn't, they had barely spoken, reached over and grabbed his hand the whole time they were landing. After they landed, he just let go, and they never talked about it. <laughs> See, some people are like that. I'd be like, what? what are we doing right now? (laughs) Like, what does this mean? Like, we need to have a DTR right now because I don't know why you're doing this to me. You know, I don't, I don't, but there are some things that we need to confront. Now, straight up, I don't do any counseling. And it's not because I hate people. It's because I love people. You don't want to come to me for counseling. Number one, I'm horrible at paying attention. Like, you're telling me your problems, and I'm like, hey, hey, hold on, look at that bird. That is awesome. Oh, I'm sorry. And like, see, so I'm number two. The last people that came to me for counseling, I think it was two years ago. I went up yelling at the guy. Um, I, I literally screamed at him. It was not a good situation because he lied to me. But we won't go into that. Um, anyway, it's so I'm just not good. So if you need counseling, we've got people here that will meet with you, that love you, they'll pray. We got people that as soon as you start crying, they start crying. They have that spiritual gift of mercy. They don't even know why they're crying. They just get in a room and cry together. It is awesome. If you start crying, I'm like, you know what? You need to clean that up. I'll be back in a little while. I don't even know what's going on right now. Like, I'm just not good. I'm not good. But years ago, I used to have to do it all. So that's, that's why our church stayed small for so long because I, I, I had this. The couple would come in, marriage counseling with me. Can you imagine this? Okay, so they're sitting there. I'm like, all right, what's the problem? I mean, this is how I could solve every marriage. Ca- I mean, if you're here tonight and you're having marriage issues, this is how I would counsel you. It would take about two minutes. I would look at you. I would look at the husband and wife and go, grow up, grow up. Next, <laughs> grow up, grow up. Next, I could do that all day. I could do that all day. So anyway, a couple would come in, and um, they would tell me their problems. And the girl would be like, okay, he's got anger issues. All right, define anger issues. Well, he's always raising his voice and yelling at me. Okay, that's not good. Do you do that? Mm -hmm, I do that. Okay. Um, And the other day, he put his fist through the wall. Did you put your fist through the wall? Yes, I did. Okay, that's brilliant, bro. Putting your fist through the wall. That is so mature. It is awesome. You should get man of the year for that. Okay, we'll get to her in a minute. Okay, and what else? Well, he just yells. Okay, do you do that? Yeah. And then this is the question I would ask. Now, don't miss this, ladies. Single ladies, don't miss this. Was he like this before you got married? Oh, oh yeah. So he... He yelled at you before you got married. Mm-hmm. And you saw him lose his temper before he got married? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He lost his temper. Why did you marry him? Here's the answer 100% of the time. Because I thought I could change him. Every time. Understand this. Marriage does not change you into a better person. It magnifies the person that you already are. Marriage is a magnifier. And if there's something great about you, it's going to to become greater in marriage. And if there's something horrible about you, it's going to get magnified in marriage. So if he's losing his temper all the time and you're dating him, when you get married, he's going to become a very, very angry man. 22 years of experience, I've seen it every time. And ladies, I just want to walk you through, because some of you grew up with fathers that yelled at you. And you think that's normal. It's not normal. You, 
God did not create you so man would have someone to yell at. You're better than that, okay? And like, well, how do I know if he's angry? Like if he loses his temper at a red light, every time he gets called at a red light, like every stupid red light, okay, that's an issue. We have to work through that. Uh, let me give you some other things to look for, ladies. Um, does he flirt with other girls? Like you're dating and he's flirting with other girls. He's openly flirting with other girls. I've had girls tell me, well, yeah, 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 he does that. But, but when we get married, that'll change because he'll have eyes for me. Mm-mm. No, he's going to have an affair on you. He's going to have an affair on you. If he's flirting with other girls, oh, no, marriage will stop him. Mm-mm. Nope. Might slow him down, but it won't stop him. And you have every right. Well, he's just calling me insecure. No, you have, you have a right to go, listen, I think the way you looked at her, I don't think that was good. Can we talk about that? Does he talk down to you? Or does he talk bad about you in front of his friends? Are you always the butt of his jokes? Because if you are, when you get married, that doesn't go away. And I know what you're thinking, girls, because girls, you have compassion, you're more emotional, you think in your heart, I can change him. And I want you to listen to me. You're not the Holy Spirit. Because in your mind, you're thinking, he's a bad guy. He's a bad guy, and he needs to become a good guy. And so I can make, I can turn him from bad to good. But you got to understand something. Jesus Christ did not die on the cross so that we could go from bad people to good people. He died on the cross so we could go from dead people to alive people. And the problem isn't that he's bad. The problem most likely is you're dating a corpse. And the, what he needs is Jesus. Well, I can be Jesus for him. You can't be Jesus for him if you're constantly compromising who God has called you to be. And when he looks at you, he doesn't see Jesus. He sees compromise. And if he does come to the cross, it won't be through you. It'll be because he had to go around you. So, so I, I want you to think about that. Because what a lot of girls do when they get in this situation is they speed up the dating process and try to get married as soon as possible. But Proverbs says in chapter 14, verse 8, the wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways, but the folly of fools is deception. In other words, give thought to that dating relationship. Proverbs 14, 15 says, the simple believe anything. I'll change, baby. It's not always going to be this way. The simple believe anything, but the prudent give thought to their steps. Ladies, I'm telling you, listen to me. If there's a red flag now, go ahead and talk about it. You have every right to because marriage is one of those things that you don't want to step into with doubts and insecurities. Question number five, is he God's best? Is he God's best? It's a great question. I, uh, one of the things I love to do is I love to have dinner with my family um, as often as possible. And we normally get together and get to sit around the table several nights a week and um, I don't do a lot of meetings at night or whatever because I like to be with my wife and I like to be with my little girl. I love spending time with them. And, um, and we've, sometimes we'll cook. I'm Lucretia, my wife, unbelievable cook. Um, I'm a decent cook. The best, my best meal is a, I cook enchiladas. I, can, I fix the best enchiladas you've ever had in your life. And straight up, I put my enchiladas up against anybody's. It's just the way it is. But to be fair, I haven't cooked them in 12 years. Because Lucretia don't like Mexican food, so I don't get to cook a lot. But anyway, so, it's, I, I, so when it's my night to cook, I, I bring home Cracker Barrel. Uh, because, because you can't go wrong with Cracker Barrel. And here's what's cool about Cracker Barrel. When you get a takeout order, you need to ask for extra biscuits, and they'll give you some. Because I just, I love their biscuits. I love Cracker Barrel biscuits. And I, I've, I've got this little system where I bring home, and I put butter on them, put jelly in them. I put them in the microwave and warm them up, and they're just good, and they kind of melt in your mouth a little bit. And so Karis 
my, you just saw her a while ago. She loves bread. She would eat bread and nothing else but bread, every restaurant we went to. So one night we came home. I got, the, I got Cracker Barrel. I'm like, honey, I've been slaving in here. You know, I cook Cracker Barrel, whatever. I got it on the table. I make the biscuits. And Karis is, is after this biscuit. I mean, she is all, uh, this biscuit never had a chance. And she is dominating this biscuit. And food is just falling in the floor. If you're a mom, remember that first five, six years of your child's life, you felt like there was that spot at the table all the time, that there was just food in the floor. Or no matter what, maybe that's your husband, I don't know. But, but most of the time, it's your child, right? There's just food in the floor. So Karis, she's, she is murdering this biscuit. And then she disappears. We don't know where she goes. She's like, boom. She goes under the table. I'm like, okay, Karis, you cannot do this. Get up from under the table. She's like, hold on. Karis, get up from under the table. Hold on. I was like, Karis. And I peeked under. And she's on the floor eating the crumbs off the, t- off the floor. I'm like, what the world? Like, so I had to, I had to, you know, I walk over and I had to sit her up and I was, I was like, baby, what are you doing? And she literally, she goes, I'm eating crumbs. I'm like, baby, do you want another biscuit? <laughs> yes, sir, daddy. That's all you had to say. You don't have to eat crumbs, baby. You're my daughter. You don't eat crumbs. We got a kitchen full of biscuits and we've got an unbelievable feast at the table. You don't have to settle for crumbs. And I believe there's a heavenly father here tonight speaking to some of his daughters going, you don't have to settle for crumbs. There's a feast at the table. And I can do for you immeasurably more than all you can ever ask or imagine. You don't have to settle for crumbs when I can provide for you immeasurably more than all you could ever ask or imagine. And some people get nervous. Some guys, you might be nervous right now. Maybe because you're the crumb. <laughs> you got some work to do in your life too. But I'm telling the girls, you don't have to settle. Me and Lucretia, we, and back in 2000, we got married and um, we we're getting ready to, we lived on campus at Anderson uh, College, now Anderson University. I was a dorm supervisor there, and we had a Bible study that met at like 11 o'clock on Wednesday nights, and, and it was great. We, we started with like eight, eight students, and it went to like 150 in like four weeks or something like that. It just exploded, and it was on relationships. So we, the next year, we wrote out about 20, 21 questions that people should ask before they get married. These are the questions you should ask before you get married, right? And so saying Lucretia is a bit detailed is like saying that the Pope is a bit Catholic. Um, she's just very detailed. Men, we're not detailed. Men can see each other and go, how you doing? Good. How you doing? Good. That's a conversation. We just, well, I talked to Bob today. How's he doing? Good. Like, like cause I know, cause I talked to Bob. Women have never had that conversation ever. So she's a little bit more detailed. And so I'm writing out questions and she writes out questions and she wrote out this one question and I was like, maybe, <clears throat> can we shorten that question? She was like, what's well, a good question? I'm like, I'm not saying it's not good. I'm just saying Can we shorten the question? She was like, all right, will you shorten it? And I tried, and I couldn't. So I literally taught an entire lesson on this question. Now, listen, ladies, don't try to write this down because your hand will fall off, and then then we're going to get sued because your your hand fell off in a service, and we're going to have to reattach your hand. We'll put it on my blog, okay? There's no way I could tweet this. It would shut Twitter down. Um, But we'll, you know, Facebook it. We'll throw out some carrier pigeons. We'll get the word out, all right? But this is the question, ladies. This is the question that I thought that my wife came up with this. It's great. Here we go. Is this the kind of love God meant when he created Adam and Eve? The kind between two people that truly reflects his love for us. The first Corinthians 13 kind. Or are you settling for less than God's immeasurably more than anything you can ask or imagine? Now that's good. Let me read it again. Is this the kind of love God meant when he created Adam and Eve? The kind between two people that truly reflects his love for us. The 1 Corinthians 13 kind. Or are you settling for less than God's immeasurably more than anything you can ask or imagine? Because God said in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. When it comes to every area of our lives, including relationships, that's what we got to believe. Now, let me finish tonight. Let me just say this, and I'm done. If you're a dude here in our church, especially if you're a single guy, man, I'm tough on y'all. I really am. 
Like every time I, I know I go into relationships, you're like, oh, crap, here we go. Perry's going to tell me to get a job and quit looking at porn and, um, and get out of debt and go to the gym. And, oh, God. But listen, guys, here's, here's one thing I know. In this church, on all of our campuses, we've got some godly, young, single men that are doing their best to follow Jesus. I mean, I know you're here, and I'm proud of you, man. I'm not saying you're perfect. I'm not saying you have it all together. But here's what I know about you. Right now, you're fighting for a girl that you don't even know her name yet. You're fighting to stay pure. You're fighting to go against culture. You're fighting to be a godly man. You're fighting to do what's right. And, man, I want to encourage you as, a, as your pastor, as your big brother, and say, way to go. Thank you. Keep up the great work. And, girls, listen to me. You... Don't, don't use the excuse where there just aren't any godly men, men because there are. There are. There really are. But girls, here will be my challenge to you. In your heart, you've got to believe that God wants great things for you. One of the things I try to teach Karis, and I teach her this all the time, is God is a good God that wants good things for his children. That's one of the things I'm teaching her all the time. God is a good God that wants good things for his children. God wants good things for you in your dating relationships especially. You, yeah, listen, he is the king, you are the princess, and all he wants is a man who's willing to fight for your heart and pursue you for the rest of your life. And you are worth that pursuit because you belong to him. Don't settle for anything less. You don't have to settle. And listen, when you refuse to settle, sometimes it's lonely. Sometimes it's tough. Sometimes it's hard. People have told me, well, Perry, the trash gets taken out more than Christian girls. You're right. But the only place the trash gets taken to is the dump. And you don't have to go there because you are worth so much more. So I would, I would ask you, as your pastor, as your big brother, and tell you, you don't have to compromise because you have a Father in heaven that wants immeasurably more for you than all you could ever ask or imagine. Can we pray together? And with heads bowed and eyes closed, I just want to ask you this question. What did the Holy Spirit say to you during this message? Maybe you're single and you're in a relationship that you don't need to be in right now. And listen, you know it. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying you know it. Maybe you're a girl here and you've thought for the longest that you're not worth the pursuit. And maybe you just need to own the fact that God wants great things for you and you need to surrender your life to Jesus tonight or resurrender your life to Jesus tonight. Maybe you're a single guy and you are challenged to fight for purity today so you can have intimacy tomorrow. Maybe you're a married couple and God used one of these questions to spark something in your marriage that's going to take you to greater places. I don't know what the Lord said to you, but here's what I know on all of our campuses. If God spoke to you, in just a second, we're going to stand here in Greenville for closing prayer. I'm going to count to three and we'll all stand. And if you're here and you feel like you need someone to pray with you or for you about the message, about whatever you just heard, then I want to invite you as everybody stands just to step out of your row and exit out the back doors. We've got people back there that love to pray with you and for you. And if you're not exiting for, for prayer, I would ask you that you just stand there for just a few more seconds and let's let everybody that needs to exit, exit. Because listen, nobody's back there that wants to throw rocks at you. We want to help you and serve you in any way. So if God spoke to your heart and you're like, you know what? I need to pray with someone about this tonight. I need someone to pray for me about this tonight. Then you move when we stand for closing prayer. Everybody, let's stand on three. One, two, three. Let's stand. Everybody with heads bowed and eyes closed. If you need to leave, if you need to talk to someone here and in Greenville, if you're in the balcony, if you'll just exit out those back doors and come down those steps, someone would love to pray with you. If you're in the room tonight, dozens and dozens of people are leaving here in Anderson. So if you're in Greenville and you need to leave, you feel the freedom to do that. I just pray that you would have the courage to do that. If God spoke to your heart and you feel like you need to, someone to pray with you or for you, you just go right now. And we would love to serve you in that way. We would love to serve you. As I pray, if you need to leave, you leave, and I'm going to close this in prayer. Father, thank you so much, Jesus, that you are a good God that wants good things for his children. And I pray for every person here tonight, God, that we would hear the hope in the gospel. 
Jesus, that you didn't die once again to take bad from good. You died to take death to life. And Father, I pray that we would live that life and we would never compromise what you say in your word about relationships. God, that we would have high standards. And Father, we would understand that you want more for us than we could ever imagine. And when we get confused with who we're dating or even who we're married to, God, we wouldn't fix our eyes on their problems or our problems. We would fix our eyes on you because your word clearly says, in you all things hold together. So, Father, we claim that. We love you. We ask this in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, hey, and before you leave, next week, I promise you, is going to be the best week of the series. I hope you're here. Don't miss it. God bless you. I love my church. Have a great week.